for, for all the people who are joining, um, welcome to EP Wealth Advisors uh, Investing in You series. We're really excited this month to bring to you a, a very special guest. His name is Jamie Mitchell. Uh, he's a professional big wave surfer and a 10-time Molokai to Oahu uh, paddleboard champion um, and all, over, all around a knowledgeable person when it comes to health and wellness. So um, we're really excited. Jamie, welcome to uh, our episode of Investing in You. Okay, cool. Well, th no, thanks for having me, Brain, and uh, I appreciate it and uh, I'm happy to talk story and um, with everyone on the webinar and thanks for joining in and uh, wanting to listen to my Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right fun so so jamie like you know this series just so you know like it you know we're really talking about going beyond um you know investing in just the markets you know and it's like how can we make people's lives better um and so i'd really love to like hear from your perspective like how investing in, in training and really being physically fit ha has prepared you to hit your peak performance and what it's meant for your life I mean, it, it's to be honest, Breen, it's, uh, you know, I feel like I've invested in my health and, and fitness since I was five years old. I'm now 44. So I feel like I'm going on 39 years of um, training, uh, you know, looking after uh, how my body and just how I eat. And like this morning, for example, I was up at six o'clock. Um, I do 90 minutes of hot yoga at seven. I came back, I jumped in an ice bath real quick, made something to eat, said hello to my two daughters and quickly jumped on, you know. So, you know, for me to uh, to invest in this conversation, mm -hmm. I, you know, for me to go and do that, I'm, I'm at a better level. My mm -hmm. mind's working better. I feel good about myself. I know mm -hmm. that I'm going to give you guys uh, the best version of me right now. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like you can just use that in all parts of life, right? Like I feel like if, you know, for me, getting up and training and investing in that, you now if mm -hmm. I was to go to work, I'm gonna get the best version of me, which is going to be better right. for the people I'm working with, making better investments, making better decisions, being a better business partner, being a better, yeah. part, you know, partner, it just keeps going and going and going. But in, in a nutshell, I feel like that's, you know, if you're in, investing in not just physical health, by training also your mental health, which is nearly more important, to be honest. Um, you know, you combine those two together, then you get the best version of yourself. Yeah, no, it's really interesting how like, you know, staying active actually like keeps you like more mentally sharp as well. Um, but I wanted to, to, to hear some of the stories, right? So you talked about starting to train at five years old and you know, like one of the things that I know about is like, you know, you were in nippers, you're around the ocean, there's a lot of paddle boarding, um, yeah. you know, a lot of like lifeguard competitions. And, and so that like transitions you to, you know, like winning the, the Molokai to Oahu paddle championship. And for those who, of you who, do, who are not aware of it, um, there's a big channel in between uh, Molokai Island and Oahu. It's, it's 32 miles across. It's got the nickname of like the channel of bones. Um, it's very choppy water. It's a lot of downwind. It's a very difficult race, um, arguably uh, the most prestigious in the paddle world. And and for Jamie to win it 10 consecutive times, it's, it's really a testament to, to his endurance. So Jamie, I, I'd love to hear about how you started getting into uh, this, uh, you know, these big paddle championships and what it was like for you to compete and how you were able to do so um, you know, throughout this process. Yeah, I think one thing, um, and I guess maybe we can touch on this later, but I think one thing that's important in my story is my asthma. So yeah. if you're talking about investing in your health, uh, I had I was diagnosed with chronic asthma as a really young child. Mm. So, um, you know, my parents invested in getting me swimming lessons and getting me to the beach and swimming, which um, allowed me to even have some sort of a childhood, you know, let alone um, compete and be an athlete. Mm -hmm. And do the nippers, which if, if anyone doesn't know, nippers is uh, what the junior lifeguards would be in America. So mm -hmm. you know, I started out doing that at a young age. Uh, I, look, I, I was a full-on jock. I did every every, every sport possible I, I did. But <laughs> I, gra I gravitated towards the ocean and the water um, more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so a big part of my life was competing in the Ironman-style racing. So swim, mm -hmm. board, surf, skis, yeah. right up until my 
early 20s. You know, I was really heavily involved. I wanted to be a professional Ironman, mm. um, you know, and, and I got I got pretty close to doing that. And then uh, Molokai, the, that, that whole transition, <laughs> I, I, I got um, introduced to that race uh, and then decided that I wanted to go and try and do it. Um, so I went with a, a buddy of mine and um, we did it in a team back in 1999 was the first time. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we won that and I decided that I'd want to try and win that, you know, as a solo competitor by myself. So yeah. in 2002 um, was my first time that I won that race um, solo, um, first across the line and it just became an addiction. It became yeah. uh, a, an addiction that was uh, – that taught me so much about myself, um, mm. you know, just the, tr- the, the consist like, and this will go back to um, life in general and, and, and going to work and being good at work and what you do is, you know, I had to be consistent, right? So I had to turn up, yeah. I had to turn up the training. So I had to have a schedule. I had to have a training plan, you know, mm-hmm. three months in advance, you know, and, and I had mm. to, you know, make sure that I was looking after myself so I could turn up to go to work or to go to training. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and at this stage, I was working as well. So I wasn't just a professional athlete at this t- time. I'm I'm working as a lifeguard. So I'm yeah. up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm going swimming six kilometers. I get out. My breakfast is in the car, ready to go. I drive straight to the beach, set the beach up, eat breakfast, you know, get to lunch break, go train in my lunch break, finish work, go training, repeat, yeah. repeat, repeat, you know, and yeah. – uh, you know, and that takes a lot of um, a lot of consistency. It takes a lot right. of mental mental fortitude. You know, you got yeah. to really, really, um, you know, setting a goal and going after it. You know, is, is uh, you know, I, I love setting short term goals. I love setting mm-hmm. long term goals, and that all encompassed into getting to the start line of that race. And then once you get to the start line, you're in you're in the dance party. You know, yeah. Then it's, then it's really up to you. You know, like. People say, what's the most, you know, how did you do it? How did you win 10 times in a row? I'm like, the winning is not, the winning wasn't the most impressive thing, as weird as that sounds. It was actually, like I said to people, I said, imagine trying to get to a, uh, one thing every year. Like say your family has a, 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 a camping trip yeah. for 10 years. You've got to turn up to this camping trip. Just the camping trip. You don't have to do anything special. You just got to turn up with your tent, your kids for 10 yeah. years in a row. This time, this date, be there. Yeah. Like imagine how hard how hard that is, right? To, just the consistency of doing it over and over again. Well, to commit to that, right? And then to turn up and then to turn up healthy, to turn up yeah. feeling 100% and then to be able to give yourself the chance to compete at the highest level. Now, that to me, when it's all said and done, I look back at it. I'm like, mm-hmm. how, how, how the hell was I able to pull that off? Because mind yeah. you, back in the early days, I wasn't looking after myself as good as I do now. We were having a few <laughs> drinks and stuff along the way, you know, a few Aussie beers, you know. So, I mean, yeah. you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where you, you commit to something and you give it your whole attention and, you know, hard work pays off and consistency pays yeah. off and, and, yeah. So, so at what point do you stop working that lifeguard job? Like, what's it like? What point does like your life really change then? You know, when, when you're when you're going through this process of winning ten straight, is it six years in or seven years in or ten years in? You know, like what happens there? Yeah, you know, like I was uh, I was a permanent 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 part time lifeguard, which you know I was making you know pretty 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 good money for, as a, for a lifeguard. You know, I was making sixty yeah. seventy grand a year. You know, which is yeah. Great job, you know, like a semi-professional athlete, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Quicksilver came along in 2000 and throughout, I won 2002, three, four, I think it was 2005. And this guy, yeah. Barrett Tester, who was organizing, goes, hey, we want to give you a pair of board shorts. We'll give you 500 bucks to wear the board shorts in the race. Because yeah. they had bet on that I was going to win the race and they could promote that I was wearing their board shorts, right? So, yeah. um, so I was like, oh, well, 500 bucks is will pay for my <laughs> escort boat, so I'll take that, you know? <laughs> And then uh, about a year later, they um, Quicksilver Australia came back and said, "Hey, well, um, we want you to we want to sponsor you, and you know, and we'll give you twenty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars." And I was like, "Well, that's cool. That's awesome. Like, 
but I was at that same time, I'm like, what am I gonna like $25,000 is not enough to travel the world and yeah. do anything and have a life, right? So I'm like, do, do I keep lifeguarding? Do I yeah. give that money? And what? And, and I just was like, no, this is my opportunity. Like, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. Like, mm -hmm. I may never get another chance like this to be a. So I quit lifeguarding. I went to my bosses and said, hey, I got this opportunity. Like, I'm, I don't want to be one of those guys that go, I should have, I could have, I wish I had done that, but I didn't yeah. have regrets. So I quit my lifeguard job. I was moved back in with my parents and just and said, I, I want to commit to winning this race and commit to. Yeah going to surf big waves and 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 hopefully that will get me further along the track you know get me more sponsorships get yeah. me a better deals along the track so i took a big chance you know in um you know in, in quitting my job to to do that and uh yeah so that was like in 2005 2006 yeah wow i mean it, it, it's it's amazing what that type of training you know was able to do in terms of unlocking that opportunity and you started to allude to that next phase in your life and I really love to hear it, which is, you know, you're, you've you've been training in more of like a pure endurance level sport for for a long time, right? You know, it, this is like marathon level for people who like who are unfamiliar. Um, you know, this is like Ironman level, and then you switch to uh, professional big wave surfing, right? How how did you go about doing that switch? Were the things that you you switched up in your training? Yeah, so I, I, I'd always loved big ocean. Like, mm -hmm. the you know, when, where I grew up obviously wasn't Hawaii, um, so there wasn't 50-foot waves, like, at my disposal, like some young kids mm -hmm. grew up to, you know. I, where I grew up in a small town in Coffs Harbour, uh, you know, big waves were, you know, 10-foot faces, 12-foot faces, right? Yeah. So, But in that environment, I wanted to be out there. Like, I yeah. was that kid that – I was the show-off. I was a kid yeah. that I wanted everyone talking about. Jamie's that got Jamie crazy. Jamie was crazy. He was out the mouth of the harbor. He was out there when it was big, and I'd snap my boards and rook, like my parents probably were cussing at me. I was just breaking thousand dollars boards because <laughs> I wanted to go out and be that guy, right? So yeah. I already I had that in me, and I you know I got a jet ski while I was lifeguarding in Australia, and I, I found a partner, and I just you know I fell in love with Laird and Dave. Larry Hamilton, Dave Kalama, and watched all their DVDs. And at that stage, I was coming to Hawaii doing the paddleboard races, and I, I was getting int introduced to all these legends of big wave surfing, like that paddled. And uh, they're like, Jamie, you got to come back for the winter. You know, come back and you know, come start surfing the winter. And so I did. So in 2004, um, I came back and did three months uh, in the winter. I stayed with Charlie Walker, who. Um, is a legendary big wave surfer on the North Shore who was my um, boat guy for Molokai mm -hmm. for the 10 years I won. He was on my boat, giving me the water, helped me with my course the whole time. And yeah. I stayed in his old shaping bay, like an old yeah. sanding bay in the back of his place at sunset. And I just started surfing sunset, started surfing Waimea. And um, I just, that was it. I kept coming back every year for three months, three months in the summer for the paddleboard race, three months in the winter. Uh, for um, we, yeah, for for surfing and just got addicted and kept coming back and now I'm here full time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I guess it's not a surprise. Like you slowly migrated over to Hawaii over the course of uh, over the course of your career. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I'm really curious about, right? So you know, you you have this big change in your life. Um, I'm curious about two things. Like, how do you change Sorry, your Grant, training? I'm losing. I'm losing you a little bit there. Okay. All right. You, you let me know. Can you hear me a little bit better I now? Hear, I, yeah, I can hear better now. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that, that I'm, there's, there's, there's two pieces of this, which is, uh, are there things in which you did to change up your training, right? Oh, to yeah. go from, from, I mean, because you go from this part of your life where you're, where you're doing all sorts of endurance and you go to, uh, you know, it's, it's much more like big sprints, being able to hold your breath. Like, you know, so I'm curious, like what you did um to change that up yeah i think if you look at anything in life um you know if you're at a job and you you change roles you have to change the way that you approach things and i looked at that you know i took it i had so many great advantages um from paddling like the you know paddling big water big oceans like the molokai like the way that i could see the water and i could see mm -hmm. wind and chop 
was right. just perfect for pa pa uh, surfing big waves because you know when you're trying to paddle into say jaws and it's windy and you know if you're looking at little entries and the way to get into waves like i i i was the best in the world at doing that so i was like okay like i already know how to do this and so i took it took that everything that i knew that i was already good at mm -hmm. and then right. i was like okay well i'm gonna obviously keep tuning that up i don't want to lose that but then right. also now like what what do i need to get better at so number one i needed to be better at just pure surfing so yeah. i just started surf more and then obviously uh at this stage most of my training had been like just pure endurance and strength and mm -hmm. so i'm like well i need to be a bit more limber a bit more flexible so i started to do yoga mm -hmm. um and i found that's helped me a lot and then i've always swam a lot swimming has been really good for breathing you know, through my mm -hmm. asthma but but then you need to hold your breath for potentially 30 40 seconds underwater after a giant wipeout then okay well i need to start understanding how to breathe and i'm um, doing breath work and doing free diving courses so i went and did a free diving mm -hmm. course and and uh so yeah and and to be honest just getting you know at this stage i'm in my 30s and i'm not 25 or in my 19 right. or any, anymore so I'm looking at low impact stuff. So I like riding my mountain bike, you know, I like mm -hmm. not necessarily downhill where I can break a collarbone or anything, but I like riding up the hills. It's in the back of Pupake here. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's great cardio work. It's um, great for your legs and it's low impact. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I looked at things that I could, um, that could help me in my big wave progression that mm -hmm. um, number one would help me in the moment, but would help longevity. And I feel like, um, you know, the, the, the yoga, especially, um, and all the breath work. And then, um, as mm -hmm. I was saying before, I, I have a, I, I recently purchased a sauna about 18 months ago. So I have my own mm -hmm. sauna ice bath at home. So I'm constantly yep. doing my sauna ice bath for recovery as well. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, you know, that's how I, um, really transitioned, you know, took my training to a, to, to a different level. And then, you know, also your mental, mental side of things is, you know, it's working on your mental, how you approach swells and not being freaked out by them and being able to relax and make good decisions um, when yeah. you're under heavy, heavy stress. Right. So getting into that heavy stress, what's it like, you know, to be at the top of one of the way, those waves and taking off? Like, what's it feel like to have that much air beneath you or have that big of a wave behind you? You know, I'm just curious because that's a that's an unfamiliar feeling for a lot of people yeah it's uh it's i mean it's incredible it's uh it's that adrenaline junkie in us you know it's uh right. the challenge of i think there's you know in, in surfing uh, you know in water sports uh, i mean what more challenge is there is to paddle sometimes on a piece of fiberglass and try and paddle into the biggest waves in the world you know yeah. not only does it take courage and a lot of skill um you've got to love it but it takes a lot of mental fortitude to to paddle out into the it's like it's like first responders right it's like the firemen that they're running into danger to save people to yeah. endanger their own life we're not necessarily going out to save people but we're going out to challenge ourselves, knowing very right. well that it may be our last day on earth yeah you know so to wrap to wrap your head around that um and to do that and then, you know, and then eventually, like you say, paddle, catch up wave, be in that moment. It's an incredible feeling that uh, there's, there's no feeling like it. And uh, yeah. that's why you you have to invest in your health and fitness yeah. and training. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm curious because we we do have a question from, from one of the listeners right now. Um, so did you use a coach along this process? And you know, if so, one of the questions that you know this listener has is about the, the key learnings you needed to provide coaches working with you so they could understand what you you needed, right? And, and the basically the premise is coming from this place of, you know, probably not many coaches or, or support staff have experience with, you know, like your your type of um, your type of surfing, right? Yeah, so I've ne no, I've never had a coach surfing. Um, I, you know, I, luck, but luckily enough, I've had great mentors, uh, guys like mm -hmm. Peter Mel, um, mm -hmm. who has just caught some of the best waves in the history of big wave surfing the last few months. Uh, legend from Santa Cruz. You know, he was um, 
you know, sponsored by Quicksilver when I was sponsored by those guys. And so we, yeah. we struck up a great relationship back then. And he actually took me out to Mavericks for the first time mm-hmm. um, when we were doing a photo shoot in San Francisco. So um, Tom Carroll, um, Barton Lynch, um, certain guys, Dave Kalama, um, you know, I've had, I've had these relationships that I've been able to just be a sponge and, and, and get information from these guys that came before me. And, um, you know, I've been able to ask just all these questions, whether they're silly or you think they're silly or stupid, but you yeah, know, that, that, that's what, that's what I would do. And so, yeah, so I, I, I didn't have specific coaches coming to events with me or anything, telling me how to do things. Like mentors. Yeah. But mentors that I could call up and if you're in the lineup, you know, people will help you. Hey, this is what you need to do here. This is where you're going to sit. This is the best place. And then then after you sort of get that information, you how you deal with that is sort of how, how good you become and how skilled you become out there. Yeah, yeah. So like another one of the questions coming in was, you know, when you're seeing like a difference in training, you know, when, when there's a jump in wave size, like right? when you go from surfing 15, you know, like 15 foot waves to 20 foot waves, you know, and th- this person was talking about how they haven't surfed waves that big yet, but they were just curious if there's an additional level of commitment or training that, that you think is requisite. Oh, hundred percent. You, you've got to, you know, you've got to be able to walk before you can run. And I think that's been a big part of big wave surfing is that, you know, and it's like, uh, it's like climbing the ladder at, 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 at your business, at the job, right. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, start from the bottom and, yeah. you know, you're not necessarily going to get you know, vice president after three months. You know what I mean? Like you got to earn that spot. And, and that's what it's like with big waves, you know, and, you know, even the best guys, in the, even the best smaller wave surfers in the world, um, you know, don't go and just jump straight in the jaws. You know, some right. may, but they may, you know, they, they might be used to surfing sunset and they, they might dabble in some Waimea and, you know, yeah. maybe some outer reef stuff. And then it's like, okay, like, Genuinely speaking, if you see them come to Jaws, they will be with someone that's very well respected or, or knows the place and, and they're mm-hmm. gaining information off the guys that surf big waves. So, yeah, but you need to step it up. You know, like if you have been surfing, you know, Blacks, for example, in Southern California and then you've made your way to Todos and mm-hmm. you've been surfing 12 to 15 foot Todos Santos, mm-hmm. you know, maybe 25 foot Mavericks is not the next step straight away. Maybe it's... Yeah. You know, just continuing to to build on your training to get right. fitter, to get your yeah. breath hold better, and yeah. then to you know ta- you know get some bigger waves at Todos and you know and, and go to Mavericks when it's 15 feet and start to learn the lineups and and then work your way to where you know there is a stage where you have to take the jump, you know, but uh, do the necessary steps the right way to to mm-hmm. do it the right way and you, right. you'll generally have better success. Right, right. So, so, so after that, you, you like you're still in this midst of this big wave career, but you're starting to co- kind of come back to your earlier roots around paddling, you know, where you had the Seven Crossings project, um, where you paddled the Seven Crossings of the Eight Channel Islands. And for for any of you who are familiar with uh, the West Coast of, of California, we have, I mean, Catalina is just off the coast of where EP Wealth Advisors headquarters is. But, you know, there's eight islands, you know, so it's all the way up from the islands in Santa Barbara. So you paddled each of those channels. You're going back to that. How do you re-engage then around training for something where you're paddling, you know, five days, you're paddling 190 miles? Like, like what kind of things are you doing to, to get back in that mindset? Yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting one because I, re- I literally had finished Molokai. My last Molokai race was 2011. And. I really hadn't been on a paddleboard since then <laughs> until uh, I did start mm. training for the seven crossings. And so, but obviously, you know, you're paddling when you're surfing, but it's a little different when you're paddling long distances. So, you know, I, I, again, from all my experience, I just started to paddle. I started just paddling, um, you know, I started off 30 minutes every, every second day for two or three weeks. And you know, I would, um, I just, built it, I you know, built it up. Then the next week, you know, after that, it was like, hey, I'm going to go for an hour. Mm-hmm. And then once I felt like my biggest thing was I couldn't afford to get injured. I had a small window of opportunity of like four mm-hmm. months to get ready for that. So the biggest, my biggest fear was getting injured or doing something where I couldn't train and that would have been the end of it. So, right. so rest and recovery was just as important as the training. 
yeah. um, getting massages. Um, yeah. You know, I would get a, a really gnarly, loamy, loamy massage. Um, mm-hmm. And this goes back to having your schedule set, you know, on a Monday yeah. morning after because I'd paddle long on Saturday, breast Sunday, Monday morning, I'd go and get beat up by uh, my loamy, <laughs> loamy guy. And then, and then Thursday, I would have a sort of a more of a sports soft tissue massage on Thursday. And so, yeah. And then in between that, I was swimming, yoga, mm-hmm. yeah. and paddling. Yeah. And ice bath and sauna. Yeah. I mean, this all sounds very familiar because, like, the, the way we help our, our clients is really about like aligning the goals, then coming up with a plan and an investment strategy. And so, by the, you know, like when you're going over that course of the process, it really comes down to like classic strategic planning. You know, like, what are you trying to accomplish? How are you going to get there? What are the things that you need to do that are unique for for the typical goal that you have? Um, you know, so that that's super interesting. But th- there's also one more thing now because it seems like you're ping ponging between uh, paddling and big wave, right? So you know, you, you go from paddling. You know, you you win all these championships with the Molokai. You know, you're, you're incredibly well prepared for that. You switch it up. You get into big wave surfing, um, and you know you're doing that, and you're still doing that. And now you're starting to get into these like channel crossing projects with the seven crossings project. And then I didn't know if you're if you're open to it, but I'd love to hear you share like what you're working on for, for the future of big wave surfing, too. Well, yeah, it's that that's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, if anyone's listened to or has been watching Surfline, um, I started the podcast called the Late Drop Podcast, which mm-hmm. uh I thought that um, we have such unique characters and awesome men and women that are in the big mm-hmm. wave community that mm-hmm. don't really get the chance to um, tell their story. So for me, uh, you know, that's part of the bigger picture. I created um, that's called the BWSA, which is the Big Wave Surfers Association, yeah. um, with a with a buddy of mine, Zach Porter, a partner of mine, and mm-hmm. you know, with the goal of trying to um, just create the content and tell the stories of what these awesome men and women are doing. And the Late Drop podcast is um, a part of that with Surfline. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a you know a bunch of projects coming up soon. But you know, in the in the general gist of things, it was, you know, we felt like big wave surfing wasn't getting the recognition that it's yeah. deserved. Um, and you know, I really just want to spotlight the men and women athletes and and how they you know, for lack of a better term, you know, like everyday people turn into superheroes and first responders and travel yeah. around the world and yeah. put themselves in danger to surf these waves. And, you know, all you guys see are this giant wave with a black wetsuit. Yeah. But I, I want to tell the stories about who these people are and put a face to the name. And I think they yeah. deserve it. And I think it's it's time that, you know, they get that recognition. So, yeah, my, yeah, my goal is to help. These are my friends. These are my mentors. My friends, the up and coming youth, the kids, the men and the women that are right. trying to, um, I want them to have a career. If they want to be big wave surfers, I'd love to be able to help them um, create a career path. Um, yeah. And so I'm investing in, you know, trying to invest in myself and my partners to invest in them yeah. so they can, so they yeah. can have a future, you know. Yeah, th- I mean, that sounds amazing. I, I, I can't wait to see what comes of it. Um, so like, let's get back into the nitty gritty on, on the training part, right? So, you know, there's questions coming about weight training and all that, but like, I didn't know if we wanted to start to like break down, you know, the training into like really specific categories, right? So, you know, the one that you and I had talked about that actually hasn't quite come up yet, except for, uh, what not to do earlier when you're talking about drinking the beers is diet, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'd love to hear like what you like, like how you approach diet, like what kinds of things are you looking to eat, you know, in preparation, pre-workout, post-workout, and even like when you're in, you know, maybe a big wave situation or in your like an endurance situation. Yeah, I think, uh, look, I think the one thing that everyone should understand is that everyone's body is different. You know, um, what your body works well with is different than what mine will work well with. So I think, um, experimenting finding what works for you i mean if you're mm-hmm. really really serious and you're really into it create a food diary write down mm-hmm. how you feel after certain foods uh you know i i stopped having a lot of carbs um after mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know in, in australia we just eat a lot of meat and potatoes you know pastas and, <laughs> and, and and i realized that that didn't work for me so i started to cut out all rice pastas 
breads. My mum worked in an Australian bakery, so like you imagine how much freaking bread I ate. You know, it's like <laughs> like a family crisis. These yeah. breads, well, yeah, you know, I was like, Brr. so um, you know, I worked out real fast that I, I work better off protein. Um, so yeah. for me, I keep a real simple diet. I we 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 as a family have we um, eat a little bit of red meat, a little bit of chicken, some fish, um, fruit, veggies, and that's really about it, Brain. We, we, it's very, very simple. Um, you know, obviously I, you know, take supplements. Um, you know, I do a lot of smoothies with lots of collagen and turmeric and some really good pro, plant-based protein powders. Um, and again, mm -hmm. that's all um, based off of what your body can handle and, and what it's like, you know. But look, I've always said you know, when I'm at my best performance, it's, there's, there's three things. There's, there's diet. There's training, and then there's the alcohol, right? Or or whatever 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 your vice is, right? It's alcohol yeah. or it's smoking or whatever whatever it is. Like so, yeah. so you, if you can, if you can do all three things, if you can, ha can if you can control the you know the the alcohol or and and the food or sugar, and the training, yeah. you know if yeah. you can do, if you do two out of three, it's okay. One out of three is not so good, but if you can get all three together. And you know, and everything, yeah. everything, you know, like they say, everything in moderation, everything is balanced. But for me, when I know that I'm, I'm potentially putting myself at life's risk. It's there's no, there's no like, well, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. You know, like I, you know, yeah. I, I will, I very rarely have a drink anymore. Like I can't even remember yeah. the last time. Um, and I just, you know, it's just a real clean, simple, basic diet that I like to to live off. It's. Mm. Don't have to think about it too much. I think diets can get in your like can be can freak people out too much, like counting food and calories and all that. It's yeah. you know, keto diet, it, paleo yeah, diet. I yeah. think it can get a little overwhelming, but I think that if you just go off the basis of the the simple food groups, you know, of uh, yeah, you know, eat, you know, eating food out of the fruit. earth and vegetables, yeah. fruit, you know, and you know, well, some people like a, a vegan, a vegetarian, and that works for them, and that's awesome. Um, you know, we eat vegetarian a few nights a week ourselves. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I think it's just a good, healthy, balanced, simple diet that works for me. And, um, I don't overthink it. And, you know, mm. I, I travel the world, you know, I've, I've got to be able to adapt too. like, there's times where if I can't get great quality food, but I need to eat, I can't be like freaking out. Oh my God, I've got to have a hamburger before, before I, you know, I'd rather eat and than not eat before I go and spend a day out in the water. You know, some people don't like to eat as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm the guy that can go and eat a burrito and one an hour later be served Mavericks. Yeah. I'm like, like a yeah. big burrito, you know, breakfast burrito. Yeah. Like some people are like <laughs> having a coffee and going to the toilet five yeah. times and, and, you know, yeah. so each yeah. to their own, each to their own, you yeah. know. So, so I, I'm curious about, uh, so we we actually had a like a the chief medical officer of a of a local hospital on last month, and he talked about the, the you know the value of a Mediterranean diet is very similar to the, to what you're describing, you know. So it's like you know a little bit of fish, a little bit of chicken, not overdoing it on the protein, and making sure you have the vegetables and the fruits, like a little bit of grains. It sounds like yeah. is more part of the vet, the Mediterranean diet than what you're doing. But I'm also curious about like you know you know because you know. Like what are you doing post training? Are you, like if you're on these big endurance things, like are there like supplements that you're using during it so that you can get across? Um, yeah, yeah, that for sure there is, and uh, it, it changes, you know, because like technology and how good uh, people are creating products these days they just get so so much better all the time, you know. Like so, for example, on the Seven Crossings, as you well know, um, mm -hmm. you know, I. Uh, you know, for breakfast, my go-to is eggs, was eggs and avocado. So it's, it's mm. a really light protein-based food. And then I ate dates. Dates and I I like the I like the hydration multiplier called liquid IV. So mm -hmm. I would drink some liquid IV and water through the day, mm. eat some dates, and I was paddling eight to nine hours on some paddles, and I was and that's the first time uh you know, back in the day during Molokai, I was having all these gels, sugar gels, and, and I think I was nearly reversing the uh, the, the effect. I was actually going better because I was having so much sugar. So mm -hmm. this time I just really went super basic. And, um, you know, that, 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 that San Nicolas to San Clemente, which was 50-something miles and took me nearly 10 hours, mm -hmm. I literally had 
I think I may have ate six or seven dates that whole day, <laughs> you know, apart from breakfast. Yeah, and then yeah. obviously, you know, when you when you finish getting um, food into you as soon as possible, getting good quality food, I think was just important, you know, replenishing the calories. And, and uh, you know, and for me too, I, I like to have a, you know, some sort of protein shake as well afterwards to just get that straight in your system. But, um, yeah, you know, I was, uh, again, yeah. trying to keep things – Keep things pretty, pretty simple. Okay. So, so one of the questions uh, is about like how much weight training have been has been involved in in any of your plans? Very minimal, to be honest. Um, like with real heavy weight lifting, it, it was more. Uh, I back in the day when I was at my very best uh, for Molokai, I was I was training with a lady called Jan Carlton from Australia, and she was a part of. Uh, the Czech Institute. I'm not if, if you guys are inter- have heard about Paul Czech. He's actually from Southern California, and he created the Czech Institute. Um, so we worked a lot on body weight and um, like stability movements. I mean, mm-hmm. um, chin up, lots of chin ups and stuff like that. But not a lot of just heavy weights. I've never really been into weights. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. So but as I'm being told now, getting older, that uh, weights are probably more important to me at this age than they were at when you're younger and just naturally strong. So, uh, but, but again, I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. you know, I, I, I've had shoulder issues and stuff like that. Not, you know, not, not for too long, but you know, like using the bands, um, and yeah. all that sort of stuff for your rotated cuff and stuff. I still do a lot yeah. of that type of stuff, but yeah. not so much heavy weights. Okay. So, so getting back into like what, what you are doing, you know, it sounds like you're doing a lot of training around paddleboarding. I'd love for you, like, because there's people here that maybe haven't done either. So I'd love for you to talk about like um, how you integrate like uh, you know standard prone pa- paddleboarding with like what is more popular now with like the stand up paddleboarding, um, and and what you do with either of those two in in your routines. Yeah, well, stand up used to be a, a huge part. I you know once I transitioned out of uh, prone, I started racing sort of the professional scene on the stand-up and had had um pretty good success there and it was uh so that was a real pretty i would say it wasn't easy transition but it was pretty smooth transition into that and obviously stand-up surfing i was into that for a while there as well but um as of right now i don't i rarely will jump on a stand-up paddleboard um if i do go paddling i like to just jump on my prone and just go for an hour and get back to my Mm -hmm. roots and Mm -hmm. because it also uh i feel like it's if i'm gonna get the benefit for from paddling for big big wave surfing then prone paddling is a little bit better you know Mm -hmm. um stand-up paddling is great for your balance it's great for your core it's good for your upper body strength i sort of probably do miss that now that you've mentioned that maybe i'll incorporate that into some training now but i've only got so many hours in the day with two young daughters so but uh but you know that look i think uh i think being creative in 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 your training um, i think mixing it up is important for me at this stage of my life i want to have fun with training it's not necessarily about being the gnarliest trainer and busting my backside to (laughs) Yeah. Um, cure myself every day. I want to have fun. I want to. I, I like to train with other people. You know, yeah. I don't necessarily. I can train by myself. I've, I've, you know, I've been out in the middle of the ocean for years paddling by myself. Um, but why do that when you can train with other people and and have yeah. fun and, and 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 help people along the way as well? You know, so so yeah. for me, um, and and it's accountability. Getting back to in, yeah. investing, like getting a group of friends together and and holding them accountable to turn up to turn up to training like you got to turn up to work is fun you know if they don't turn up you can rouse them and give them a little bit of crap but uh but it's it's good to train with a group and and see everyone benefit and and everyone grow and 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 also you know give those people a push that maybe need it more than other people you know to to get them to invest in themselves and be better versions of themselves Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, the way you're considering paddling, you know, the prone version is like if you want to improve like your back and your shoulders, if you're looking for stand up, it's more about balance and core. Um, But like I think the thing that's fun and and I wasn't I guess I wasn't anticipating this is the way in which you make some of these trainings fun. Um, So I I think that's great. And now I'm curious about how do you include yoga in this? Right. Because. uh, you started to talk a little bit about this in different points in your life, and I'd love to understand how you integrate yoga into your training. 
Yeah, so yoga for me, uh, you know, my, my wife, when we started dating, she was uh, right into yoga and she tried to get me into it and I was like, I'm not having anything to do with this, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but she finally broke me down and uh, and once I was able to give it a chance uh, and go for a, a few months pretty regularly, I instantly saw the benefits. And, uh, you know, I... I think Is there I'm, a style of yoga you're doing? And like, what oh, yeah, are the I, do, I like doing the hot yoga. I guess it's the Bikram style, but then yeah. it's the 90 minutes. I like the heat, and I mm -hmm. and I like the and that's the way my mind works. I like the knowing that the same poses and being able to see the benefits of where I'm at. Am I improving in these you know poses that I'm yeah. doing? And so you know, for me, I think if if someone said to me tomorrow, Jamie. You can only do one thing that's going to help you like be f like fit or train or anything like mm. what's the one thing you would pick i mean i'd nearly have to pick yoga because yeah. I've, you know like number one the heat um you're getting that you know getting the sweat you you know like the sweat it's good for you that the internal heat you're mm -hmm. stretching you know you're getting great balance you're getting great strength work you're getting breath work in, involved you're getting all the things that we've basically been talking about in one workout so yeah it's uh it's 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 really great and 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 the mental side as well it's hard like going yeah. to do 90 minutes of hot yoga it's it's not yeah. an easy process you know so so I, I just a great example is i've just got back into it after um all my tra traveling to surf in these big waves the last couple of months and COVID and all this, you know, my local studio has just opened up and, and I've just started going back the lot. I've done maybe six sessions in the last few weeks. And from the day, the first one back to this morning, my, yeah. just is, uh, you know, my, the, my sore back that's been sore is not as sore, just everything is opening up and, and you just go, oh man, like I, I've missed it. I've really yeah. missed it. So I think yoga as an overall, now, if you're in vet, if you're investing in your health and fitness, yeah. yoga yoga is a, pr a pretty good um, a pretty good yeah. investment. Sounds a like it's good a chance. Yeah, it sounds like it's the foundation for what you're really trying to do because it because of the way it integrates so many different pieces. You know, strength, fre flexibility, you know, yeah. the ability, breathing work. Um, you know, so that that sounds great. I know you also mentioned like biking. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, like, what are the things that you're doing in terms of integrating biking? You, you're talking about going up and down hills, not necessarily, um, you know, trying to do like crazy downhills. So what are you trying to accomplish when you when you use biking in your life? Uh, look, biking is just another it's 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 I, I need to work out in my life, you know. So for me, like, you know, if the ocean's shitty. And I can't go to the pool or I've already swam, you know, if I need to do something else, I was like, okay, like what, what else can I do? And, and, uh, I've always, uh, like watching the tour de France and those guys are super fit. And, and I just, uh, so I got myself a, you know, a, a cheap, a cheap sort of style mountain bike and started riding up the hill and, and just found it was a really great low impact, you know, great cardio workout. And, uh, again, you know, I, I'm able to go with some friends or if I, don't if I go by myself, I'm able to put my headphones in, listen to a podcast or something. And uh, yeah, it's just again, it's just it's just adding a tool to the toolbox. It's just right. you know, if 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 there's something that I can't do and I want to work out, then I can jump on my, my bike and go for a ride. So right. yeah, it's just adding another tool. Okay. Um, so like there there is another thing that you've kind of touched on a couple times, which is the sauna and the ice bath. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about recovery and its role in and maybe even sleep right and its role in in training huge you know and 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 i'm i'm by no means any expert on the on the whole thing i i, I get a lot of my theories and basis of things is, is by trying i, I go yeah. off how my body feels and how i feel after doing something not off what everyone else is generally trying to tell me to do or i should do mm. so um you know I, i've used saunas obviously in the past and obviously we all know ice has worked for recovery in times, but but now with um, all these amazing health and wellness advocates out there and people that know so much, you know, it's, it's the the combining of the heat and the ice together has just been a game changer. And uh, it's uh, yeah, you know, so I, 
obviously I invested in a sauna and I, I invested in a, in a uh, I actually bought like a big outdoor, a, a big freezer that now I plug in and put filled with water and silicone it up and have a timer on it. And now it's full of ice. It's I can go down and jump in at any time. It's mm -hmm. about 35 degrees. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, literally every single night um, I'll jump in the sauna and I'll do rounds, 15 minutes sauna, three minute ice bath. And I'll do that two to three times, go to bed, sleep amazing. Um, and now my daughter, right. my five year old daughter, <laughs> she's in the in the sauna with me at last night she was in the sauna with me and then she jumped in the ice bath like just a split second but she jumped down to her neck in 35 <laughs> degrees and she's five years old and she wants to do it every night with dad so, so you know like it's uh i'm creating a monster you know what i mean but um yeah. but look again it's just adding more more to it you know like my my role as a father and a husband and you know, we've just bought a house in Hawaii to so to keep this rolling is I've got to be able to perform, I've got to be able to move, I've got to be able to work, I've got to be at my best at any time. I could get a call today, say, Hey, you gotta go surf eighty foot wave tomorrow. So I've got to be ready twenty four seven. So that's just yeah. another role for me to be able to make smart decisions at any time. And I think like, you know, a lot of these guys and girls listening today, like again, you know, if you've got opportunities to make moves and investing and whatever it is you're doing, you know, you want to make those moves with full clarity, you know, right. at your best. You don't want to be like hazy or fuzzy or, you know what I mean? Right. Cause that's when you're going to make a mistake. Right. So I, I take that same approach to everything I do in life. You know, like I want to, yeah. I want to zig when I should be zigging and zag when I should be zagging, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, along those lines, you know, one of the questions coming in is like, how much uh, training time do you allocate, you know, um, and this could be two different sports that you love to do that, that you want to be really good at, um, or is it like a more comprehensive plan? Oh, so when, when I was trying for Molokai, it was a full on schedule. I had uh, my month was mapped out my whole day, my every day, every basically every hour of every month was mapped out on what I was going to do. So, yeah. um, you know, like an Olympic athlete, you know, uh, I was up training. If I was working, I was working, training at lunchtime, you know, training in the evening, go home, eat, sleep, repeat, you know. And uh, yeah. so, you know, seven crossings, you know, things changed. Family you know, more responsibilities. Okay. Like I can't be as selfish, you know, mm. obviously, you know, my wife knows that I've got to be, uh, I've got to train and I've got to be in a great mental state to go and surf these ways. Otherwise it could be catastrophic, you know, but, yeah. but also in my, you know, what makes me happy as well as knowing that my family's happy and I can go surf with the kids and take them to the skate park yeah. and get them off at school. Right. So, and, and when you, with age comes experience and I feel like I don't need to train as much. I just can train smarter, not harder. So, so it changes, you know, right now I'm in the process of like surfing a lot. I'm not necessarily mm -hmm. training for anything specific apart from to survive big waves. So again, mm -hmm. like this morning I went to yoga. Once I'm finished talking to you guys, I'm going to take my kids to the skate park. This afternoon mm -hmm. I may go swim. Depends. It's not, it's not as in, as in intense, but I need to do at least one thing a day. I try and, you know, one usually one session a day, and once and I'm surfing. So one yeah. yoga, swim, paddle, ride, and then on top of that, it's surfing. If the surf's really good, like it's going to be this weekend, I'll be mm -hmm. surfing all day. Um, okay. And then, you know, if I know an event's coming up or I, I see long range swells coming up, I may intensify some things and start doing some specific breath work and stuff to get ready. Um, you know, and if I'm doing a seven crossings project, obviously I'll sit down and go, hey, we need to schedule out my days yeah. and, and weeks around the family and make sure yeah. that everyone is getting their, their due, you know, due, due thing. Yeah. So, so going into this, like, you know, there's obviously like a longer range plan for you. So uh, one of the specific questions is like, what, what is your plan to help you train as you get older, right? You know, I mean, you hinted at some of the things that you've already done, you know, you've gotten rid of alcohol, you've done more yoga, you know, but you, and you also started to hint at some of the things that you're thinking about doing, which is like bringing back weight training. So I'm just curious to hear, like, what, what are you thinking about integrating um, into your health so that you can, I don't know, surf till a hundred or whatever, whatever it is that your goal is. 
why, yeah, I think yoga is a big part of it. Um, yoga, I think, uh, I, you know, for me, I, I just think, uh, so, I, you know, through the winter here and before winter here, we did, uh, Kahaya Hart is an ex-professional surfer here and he does, um, he has a gym up the road. So, you know, I've been trained with a bunch of the guys, a bunch of the professional big wave guys there and, and he um, does a lot of this stuff called foundation training. I'm not sure mm-hmm. if you guys have heard about that, but it's a lot of, um, you know, breath work with certain movements that um, mm-hmm. open up the body. So I feel that really works as well. So I, I for me, longevity um, and, and in, no injuries and stuff just means staying sharp. So it's being healthy consistently. It's that twenty four seven of like eating healthy, all that yeah. stuff. It's it's keeping um, limber and flexible without being too limber. You you know you got to have that balance between being having strength and being flexible, yeah. um, and just you know making smarter decisions in the water. <laughs> yeah. Trying not to wipe out like I do at Jaws and stuff. You know every <laughs> every now and then, but. You know, I think it's low impact, you know, strength, a little bit of strength, yoga, you know, breathing, just just constantly being healthy. Just all the ice and the sauna, the recovery, all that stuff makes me feel so good every day. And, you know, even if I don't get to work out, if I get to jump into the sauna and ice at night, like I feel like, you know, I finish off the day with something that's that's helping me, you know. Like okay. so I think they're just really the simple things in, that are going to keep me to be able to keep right. continuing to do what I want to do. Yeah. Okay. So he- here's another g- good question. Um, it's, you know, because you talked a lot about the importance of, of, of your mentality through all this. So are there mental exercises that you use to accompany yourself during training, you know, something to train your focus or, or does that, is that part of your, like the, the breath training you're talking about? Yeah. Look, I think for m- me personally, I, my whole life since I was a kid has been, like intense competition and so my mental ability I, I've, I've had this ability to flick a switch on and off at when I need to and I've never really done too much mental training like when I say that um, I mean like having someone like a sports psychologist or anything like that and uh, my wife's been trying to get me into meditation so maybe meditation will be another thing that I incorporate down the mm-hmm. track um, I haven't quite got the attention span at the moment for meditation, but I, I think I'll, I think I'll get there. But, yeah. uh, but for me, just everything that I've done in my life, those, those paddles, those going out and paddling for five or six hours by yourself in the middle of winter at the middle of the shark infested waters, like just stuff like that is ingrained in, in my mental psyche. Yeah. So for me, like I'm able to just go and flick a switch on if, if you know, if, if I have to go outside now and go do something like I can just, flick that thing on and and zone in really fast. And, uh, you know, I was known for that at Molokai. Everyone would see me on the beach joking around, you know, shaking hands, taking photos with people. And then 10 minutes later, you're on the start line on the the race that means more than you and anything in the world. And I could just turn on that switch and just go into what I need to do. Not everyone can do that. And not everyone has had the upbringing that I've had. But, you know, I think that there are ways to train your mind and, uh, I think that's super important. I think it's more, I think before, yeah, a few years ago, it was a bit more taboo. Like people may have thought you were a bit of a weirdo or maybe yeah. not, you maybe you were sort of mentally like not that in there if you had to go and do that. Or I think more than ever now, athletes are using mental coaches and, and you yeah. know, and, um, yeah. Yeah. ways to be better at that. So- so speaking about like mentality, you know, we got a few more minutes and there's a couple fun questions in here that I wanted to be able to get to. So, um, you know, they were asked a little bit earlier in, in the presentation, but one of them is watching your first win at Nazare. And for those people who, who are unfamiliar with Nazare, it, it's in Portugal. It's one of the biggest waves in the world. It's a big beach rig. Um, it seemed from your first heat, even with the randomness of the waves in Nazare, that you were going to win and everyone else was vying for sec- second. How was your mindset coming into and during that day? Now, that, that's a, an amazing question because that, that's a, that was one of those days where it was flow state that you, that you yeah. hope that you get in your career. You don't get very often, but that was a, that was a day that I'd, just, I'd already flew to Europe and I was in Spain um, before I even knew the contest was there. So... A lot of the hardship that we go with is we, we have to try uh, fly last minute and travel last minute to these events, and you're so exhausted that you're running on fumes. And so I was already in 
um, in Spain and all of a sudden they're like, hey, the contest is going to be on. And I, that, at that instant, I had this feeling. I was like, oh, I'm already here. I'm already set up, like ready to um, succeed already, you know. And so instantly, and I'd been putting my time into Nazare over there for a few years and a lot of people hadn't been surfing there. So I went into that event very confident uh, and, you know, everyone was surfing down the beach at, at the lower the lower level waves um, and I started the second down because I was in the fourth heat of the day. So we have four heats, two semis and a final. And um, so I went out and in the fourth heat, um, you know, got an amazing, I was on a brand new 10-6 board, um, never rode before, and I got this incredible right right hander in towards the rocks, like a wave that not ma- many people know to take, those types of waves, and kicked out. And then I got another this insane left, and, and I was just clicked in. I, I think I came in, I had an interview, and I was so like, I think in that interview you can see I was just super uber, just clicked on and focused and yeah. – uh, you know, I had people call me and go, we knew you were going to win after we saw you that that interview. And then, yeah. um, you know, so I went from the fourth the fourth heat, um, then I had quick 45-minute rest into uh, the second semifinal. Then after the second semifinal, I had to go straight into the final. And what most people haven't known, you probably don't even know this, Breen, but in the final, it's an hour. And so this becomes an endurance event now, you know, and I'm – uh, yeah, I'm the endurance guy, right? So yeah. but on the way out, we I'm on the way out going out to start the heat. The jet ski driver cranks a turn. We get hit by the, the white water. We roll a jet ski all the way to the beach. So I'm already tired and exhausted. So we, we're getting rolled to the beach on the jet ski. I have to jump on another jet ski, go back out. We finally get out there. They start the heat an hour. Ten minutes into the heat, I'm in my spot further out than anyone giant wave comes, lands on my head, snaps my leash all the way to the beach, have to go get my board. I'm on the back of the ski going back out, get thrown off the back of the sled two times, lose my board again, go get it, finally get out, don't have a leash. My other board's in the boat around the corner. So I asked the guy on the jet ski, Ryan Hargraves, I go, have you got a leash? And he's like, I think I might have a leash. So he opens up this jet ski. There's a leash in there. I'm like, I've got to cut my my leash was tied a certain way. I needed a knife. I said, "You got, you got a knife?" He's got he had a, he had a knife. So I'm on the back of the jet ski cutting this knife, trying to put a new leash on. I finally get this all done. I jump back in the water. Like 30 minutes has gone by. I haven't even caught a wave. I've been pounded so much. I just sit there and I'm like, in my mind, I'm just like freaking out. And I sit there and I'm like, Jamie, I said, you know what? I said, what a, what a day this has been. This has been yeah. such an incredible day. Like, whatever yeah. happens, it doesn't matter, man. Like, you've already put on a great performance and just be stoked and just enjoy the yeah. moment. Two minutes later, I get a nine. Five minutes later, I get my back up. Game yeah. over. Game that's over. That, that's how things can – how fast things can change in an instant, I think, with a good attitude and being able to let go. But, um, but like – the, the listener asked, yeah, I was I was locked in. I was in the zone, flow state. I, I yeah, I, I thought I was gonna win that 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 contest from like a week before it even happened. <laughs> all right. So there there's also a couple questions and I'm gonna all roll them together because I think this should probably be about the last one. Um you know so there's there's a handful of people that are that are listening to you. They're seeing the your your extra projects, the seven crossing, they're you know, they really love the podcast. You know, and they're they're curious about they want to hear more about what like what you want to evolve into for for this next phase because it clearly looks like you're doing something. Look, I you know I I'm passionate about um, the environment. Uh, I'd like to do another Seven Crossings project. Um, you know, I think it's important to to for me to show my kids um, how to be responsible and proactive and. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I think that's just that's something that will evolve along along the way, and mm-hmm. I'm super and I'm super um, in, you know into the Big Wave Association. They're my you know that that's a it's really close to my heart. I, I just I, I re- truly believe that these men and women deserve a lot more than what they've been getting, and um, I'm, I really want to go out and showcase 
the talented um, people in our sport. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to do that through the podcast and through many other things that I can't really talk about right now. But mm-hmm. um, you guys will see the fruits of that labor, hopefully, um, in the next year or so. And uh, so, yeah, so between that, you know, having a family, keeping healthy, still trying to surf some big ways myself, um, you know, doing the surf line, you know, live, you know, from the channel takeovers, bringing people into the mm-hmm. lineup. I think that's been another part of the evolution of what we're trying to do with the Big Wave Surfers Association. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think uh, that's that's plenty to keep me, you know, busy. Uh, I think I'd like to do some more of these style things, brain, you know, the webinars, yeah. maybe some public speaking, you know, who knows? But, uh, you know, and I'll uh, and, uh, be a good dad, you know? Yeah. Yeah, being a good dad. I mean, that one hits hits close to my heart too. So, yeah. well, Jamie, I, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you, The stories are great. I love to get your perspective on how you train. You're doing so much. I know that uh, I've learned learned a lot, and I need to probably incorporate some of those things. When you're talking about the vices, that was where I was like, I got a little bit of a sugar vice that I, I need to I need to address. <laughs> so 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 do I. So do I. I got rid of I got rid of the beer. I got rid of the alcohol. Now I got to get rid of the uh, the the sugar. <laughs> yeah yeah so. Uh, I, I was feeling you right there. I was like, I know which one. Um, but anyways, I wanted to thank you so much for all the listeners um, and, and our clients. Thank you for turn, tuning in. Um, we're excited for this series. We got a, another couple coming up in the next few months. Um, next month, we'll be having a landscape architect talking about uh, how to garden. You know, And so I'm really excited to bring Lisa Bauer on from Chartreuse Landscape, um, which will be a lot of fun. Jamie, you know, again, thank you so much. you have any parting thoughts before before we let you go? Uh, look, you know, you, you, you are what you eat. You are how you act, you know, you are, you know, so look after yourself guys. It's, uh, it's not just for you. It's for your family. It's for your kids. It's, um, you know, but do it for yourself. You know, do it. You got to do it. You got to want to, you want to, you got to want to do it for yourself. And then mm-hmm. if you can do that, everything else is going to fall into place and take tiny steps, make working out fun, you know, do it with your buddies make them yeah. be, be held accountable and just have fun with it. You know, you don't have to be Michael Phelps or, you know, whoever it is. Just, <laughs> yeah. Just uh, go out and have fun and, and uh, be consistent, be consistent and have fun. Okay, cool. Well, Jamie, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. We're going to let everybody go and uh, I hope everyone has a great day.